So search is one of the most important services, especially for food aggregators like Zomato. An interesting challenge comes when a search query is not homogeneous. Instead, it contains multiple entities. For example, best Domino's pizza near me. This query contains a restaurant, a dish and a location. Getting relevant information from your search engine, like let's say an elastic search with this kind of query is a very interesting problem to solve in this video. We dive deep into how Zomato identifies the intent of the search query to better its search experience and make it more conversational using natural language processing. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year and a half now. The course is a cohort based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue at all. Instead, a small focused group of 50 to 60 engineers will be brainstorming the systems and designing it together. This way, we build a very solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course is enrolled by 800 plus engineers spanning 12 cohorts and 12 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many, many, many more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The course is focused on building systems the way they are built in the real world. We will be focusing heavily on building the right intuition so that you are ready to build any and every system out there. We will be discussing the trade-offs of every single decision we make, just like how you do in your team. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack to designing our own toilet balancer to quick buses live text commentary to doing impressions counting at scale. In all, we would be covering roughly 28 systems and the detailed curriculum split week by week can be found in the course page linked in the description down below. So if you're looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course and the second one is the recorded offering. The live cohort based course happens once every two months and will go on for eight weeks while the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to learn and want to binge learn system design, I would recommend going you for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss the systems and its design live with me and the entire cohort. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhani.me slash masterclass. I repeat arpitbhani.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I have also put the link of this course page in the description down below and I'm looking forward to see you in my next cohort. So Zomato is a restaurant aggregator which means it allows restaurant to list themselves on the platform while it also allows people to place order from their favorite restaurant. Now, one of the main medium for people to discover food and dishes and restaurants is through the search bar. Now, Zomato allows people to search for three typical entities. The first is a dish, let's say a pizza, a burger, a paneer, butter masala, something around that. Second, a restaurant, like for example, if I'm searching for Domino's, Pizza Hut or any favorite chain of yours. A third is a cuisine. Let's say I know I want to eat Chinese today, so I'll search for Chinese and it should list the restaurant that serves Chinese food. Right. When, but given that the search bar is an open text box, people can pass in any query that they want. Right? So what they can do is they can basically combine multiple of such entities and pass in query like, hey, pizza space Domino's, which means I want pizza from Domino's restaurant. Now, solving for such an input is a very interesting problem. Now, Zomato might be using something like an elastic search or, or a solar in the backend. I don't know that tech stack, but it's my speculation that they might be using something like this. By the way, this entire blog is taken, uh, by the way, this entire uh, piece of content is taken from Zomato's engineering blog, which I've linked in the description down below. I would highly recommend you to check that out. Right? But because I don't know that tech stack, it's my speculation that they might be using something around that uh, to power their search engine. Now, when you are configuring a search engine, let's say an elastic search or a solar, what you typically have is you have indexes. They might be having one index on restaurant, one indexes or one index on food. And when you are searching within that, the documents are retrieved. Now each document in a restaurant might contain a title, a description, menu, details, something around that. While on a food, you might have the name of the food, description or its ingredient and plus so on and so forth, some information around that. Now, when you're searching, when you fire a search query, you would typically provide weights to this field. For example, title gets a weight of 10, while description gets a weight of 1. So that when you're firing the query, if the query 
matches in the title. So if I'm passing in query, let's say Domino's, and if Domino's is present in the title, that document ranks higher as compared to when it is present in the description. This is the most common configuration that almost all search engine in the world are configured. Now, this is where interesting things come out. Let's say, let's say someone fires a query, best coffee near me. If this is a query that I bluntly fire on an elastic search, now what would happen? Now, if I pass this, I may configure that, hey, search for best coffee near me with title weightage of 10, description weightage of 1. Now, what would happen? Here, best coffee near me is not telling you to find the restaurant with name best coffee near me. It's not telling you anything. And right? this is a very generic query. Now, but what when this query is fired on Elasticsearch or a solar with the configuration, what it would spit out is any restaurant that has best in their name or coffee in their name or near in their name for some reason or me in their name would be ranked higher. For example, best coffee cafe may be name of a particular cafe, but that would be ranked first given that it matches the most of the word matches in the title. Then best bliss might be another restaurant bar best maybe another one. Like I'm just basically making this up, but you understand the problem with this, right? Given that best coffee near me is not about a restaurant, but about a food item coffee that you are looking for. And you are looking for restaurants that serve you best coffee, right? So this is where this is this type of query is not a homogeneous query. This query content uh, this query contains all types of entities and we need to understand what are we actually looking for. This is where natural language understanding comes in. Right? So that given a query, we try to understand the intent of the user. This is what makes this problem statement really interesting. Now, here Zomato also launched voice search. Now, this is another interesting problem. Why? Because voice search makes people speak like here we are not typing we are we are saying what we would want to search and then basically speech to text kicks in and it basically converts it into text and then this is fired in the backend now when a human is speaking when we are speaking or we are providing input to this search engine we tend to be more verbose when we speak when we type we are lazy we type fewer words so let's say uh, if i am if 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 i would want to search for let's say basically uh, let's say garlic bread with cheese dip it's neither a restaurant, it, they are dish, but there are two dish, garlic bread and cheese dip. Now, where do I search this? What do I search? Right? This is where these are very weird kind of queries. Then let's say veg restaurant in Kormangla. This is, I'm looking for a category of restaurant which serves vegetarian food in location, which is Kormangla. Now, if there is some restaurant whose name contains Kormangla, that would be ranked higher instead of location. So here the problem starts to creep in. And third, maybe let's say chai and samosa. Restaurant that serves chai and samosa, both I would want to rank them to, to oh, on the top, right? Now, single intent queries are easy to answer. Where I am looking, I exactly know what I'm looking for and which is exactly a small piece of information, a small piece of query that I'm providing, which is going there, searching for that information, title, description, body, whatever it is, and uh, giving me the search result. That is the easiest one. But here, in this type of queries, when people are allowed to be verbose, there we need to understand the intent. Right? So given a query, we need to understand what user is seeking. For example, Domino's outlet near me it should automatically, like we have to write a service that understands the intent, which means from the search query Domino's outlet near me, I need to understand that intent is to find the nearest outlet an entity, which is a restaurant, is Domino's, right? So Domino's is a restaurant, near me is the location. Intent is to find nearest outlet. Now here, what Zomato does is Zomato classifies search query into three categories, right? Which is the most common pattern that, that they have observed. They classify search queries into three categories. The first is dish plus dish, in which like people are typing multiple dish name in the search query, like for example, chai and samosa, or uh, let's say pizza with cheese dip, right? Dish plus dish is one type of query. Second type of query is restaurant plus dish. Let's say McD burger, right? They, the people are telling that I want a burger, but specifically from McDonald's. Third is let's say restaurant dish plus near me best or some irrelevant text. Let's say best pizza near me, right? So near me is an, is an irrelevant text. Uh, what you're looking for is a pizza. 
uh, and you want best of that right now it becomes really easy to understand query when you have narrowed down the scope so that is where intent identification comes in so now let's take a look at what are the challenges in this in, in this particular system so when zometa was building this the first set of challenges that there is a lack of availability of label data like for example if you would want to apply uh, machine learning or let's say data science or nlp nlu something around it you need label data we don't have label data so which means supervised approaches are kind of fuzzy over here like you may have to go for most most of the unsupervised approaches second is the queries that are being fired over here they involve more than one language for example let's say given that you are allowed to do voice search you may pass in uh, uh, makhni dal ke saath naan right that's a typical hindi phrase makhni dal ke saath naan and which means you want dal makhni with naan together like so you need to support multiple languages but here if you look carefully the sentence or the query is not very verbose that you have to understand the entire language here there are still keywords that you want dal makhni and you want naan these are junk words right you can omit them so somehow your intent identification needs to work such that you understand the context you un sorry you understand the core keywords which is dish restaurant more more importantly so dish restaurant and cuisine that is what you have to identify very well everything is junk you may just ignore if it is very diluted right third or uh, another query is let's say sabse acha pizza a very clear indication which means like you need very good pizza a very clear indication that you are looking for pizza and sabse acha is something which is very nice you may ignore it or you may make it more smarter to understand the language and convert it but no but not really needed because you get an idea that you know you need pizza that is what your intent identification needs to do third is phrase that mean the same for example mcd burger mcd k burger both mean the exact same thing that you are looking for burger from mcdonald so here you may go for a language agnostic conjunction but you cannot possibly fill in all possible languages india has like 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 basically 30 to 35 different languages in which people interact with the app you cannot possibly feed in all possible data which means you have to somehow go via the opposite route and find what's important or spot what's important and leave everything else around right fourth is spelling variation now for example rajma rice rajma chawal both mean the exact same thing because rice and chawal are synonyms so you need to handle synonyms as well rumali roti rumali roti r u m a l i r o m a l i they are phonetically similar now this also needs to be handled now how do we solve all of these complicated situations in a simple way this is where what zomato did is they leveraged word to vec byte pair encoding bidirectional lstm and crf we'll not go into the machine learning side of it but still we'd still cover it from the surface level so that it becomes easier for you to understand in case you would want to dive deeper into this part right i'll just walk you through on few critical parts that i think are important for you to know first let's go through what to vec now what is what to vec what to vec is one of the most famous way through which uh, like it's a most famous way to create word embeddings now i'll just walk you through on what word embedding is so what to vec in general is a neural network model to learn word associations now here what it does is it is a very beautiful thing so machine understands numbers like right? so your computer understands numbers one zeros almost all binary right but it does not understand words so you have to somehow make a word rep be like a word rep uh, sorry a number represent a word but it's hard to just say ki hey, let's say burger is one pizza is two that might be one but that might not be very useful so which is where what we are doing is what word to vec basically does is it converts a word to a vector vector is simply a list of numbers so it converts word to a vector such that that vector almost very accurately represents that word now how is this model coming up with this vector this is coming up with this vector depending on the corpus that we are training the model on for example let's say we are training this model on zomato's data set it, it means that we are providing it restaurants entire food menu and all the location names that you have you are training your word to you are you are training your word to vec model on this data set 
So what it would do is for every word in the vocabulary that it discovers, it would create a vector. So you may pass in the size of the vector that you would want to output. Let's say typically it's 128 or 256 something, but you may obviously uh, pass it as a parameter. And when you get this vector, now this set of numbers would very accurately represent this word such that, now this is where the fun part is, such that the vector are very closely associated to the word. For example, a very famous example of word to vec, wherever you see any word to vec video or read any blog on word to vec, this is the most common example that you will see. It converts the word to a vector such that if you operate some functions, if you apply some operations on the vector, the you may discover another word which is related. I'll give an example. Let's say if you are training it on a normal English corpus and if it's a decent corpus and you fire a query, let's say king has a vector, man has a vector, woman has a vector and queen has a vector. So if you do vector algebra on king minus man plus woman, it would give you a vector which would be very close to queen's vector. Right? And it's a very common example that you would see almost at every single blog about word to vec. Now, this is the core idea that the way this neural network defines the weight depending on the corpus is such that you can operate, you can perform any operations on this vector and it would be like performing operations on the word. Right? And now this is what makes it special because now you can use this to, you can use this along with a bunch of other algorithms to do uh, identification of synonyms because two vectors that are close to each other, their words ha might have very similar meaning. For example, man and boy would be more closer to boy and girl, right? King and queen would be opposed, like would be far away from each other. Like this would be literal representation of words in an n-dimensional space such that it holds its semantics, it holds the meaning of it, right? And this is the beauty of word to vec And mo in most cases, you just do import sci or you just do import SciPy or let's say import GenSim and then train the word to vec model to, to drive it. But to know the internals of it, it's not so difficult to understand. But I would highly recommend you to go through it, try, try it out yourself and learn about word to vec It's a very fascinating thing. But you typically don't use it standalone, you use it along with something else. Right. Okay, that is first, word to vec Now, when we, when we were talking about the problems, the, the, the overall challenges that came with this, one of the challenges were multilingual queries. We saw how there are filler words when we pass in the search queries, say, Sabse Acha Pizza or McD K Burgers. K does not hold any, infor or any, any information there. So you need to have a language agnostic way to tokenize those strings such that you keep what matters while discard everything else. So now this is where you would want a way. So uh, let me start from beginning. There is the most common way to tokenize a text. Now what is tokenization? Let's say you have a text. Uh, uh, let's say it is called as uh, dal makhni ke saath naan. If let's say this is your uh, string dal makhni ke saath naan, you would want to tokenize it such that the basic way is the let me wherever I find a space I would split it so dal becomes one makni becomes another k becomes another sat becomes another and nan becomes another that is one way to look at it but is this the best way there is a very high chance that you what you are looking for might not be present as an independent word it might be present as it's like when speech to text is happening, the way it would come out, you don't know how uh, the library that you are using for speech to text converts it to text. So that is where what you need is you need a sub word tokenization. Let's say I have a dish name called fried rice with no space F R I E D R I Z E. But every other restaurant in the corpus uses fried space rice. So you, would you want to consider fried rice as one token or fried rice as two token, right? Now this is exactly how where sub word tokenization comes in and what the algorithm that they use 
to create this vocabulary is called byte pair encoding for tokenization. It's called basic BPE in short form. It's a very simple but very beautiful, very elegant implementation. I would it's again very simple one. I have linked a couple of resources for you to understand byte pair encoding in the uh, in the description down below. Highly recommend you to check that out. You would see how beautiful this algorithm is. It is a supervised way to do it, which means that it helps you define a tokenization scheme depending on the corpus that you provided. It's not a generic way that hey, split at space or split at quotes or split at a special character. It splits within the word itself. Or like uh, it, it, it can also split within the word if that word is present in the corpus. So it operates on the frequency and it tries to reduce that. It's very simple, very fascinating algorithm that it powers. Like brilliant implementation. I've linked a couple of uh, videos and blogs that you can find it helpful it's in the description down below highly recommend you to check that out and this is byte pair encoding so they use this two to create or to train word to vec word to vec outputs you this word embedding these vectors are called word embeddings these word embeddings are then used by a bidirectional lstm it's a neural network thing a long short term memory i won't go into the details of it plus crf I won't go details into it either, but just knowing that how to use it is good enough for you to get started. Otherwise, this video would become a, an hour long video, right? But as an output of this, when you train the entire neural network on all of this thing, it becomes very elegantly used to do named entity recognition or something called as uh, sequence tagging. Both are similar. So what sequence tagging does is what is it is exactly what we have to do. So for example, if someone types in mix veg sabji or roti, so you have to tokenize it and then identify what is a dish, what is a restaurant, what is a location, something around that, right? So for example, mix veg sabji, these three words together is a dish, is what we have to answer. Right? This is what bidirectional LSTM would do because you are training it to identify dish, 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 merge it into a dish, right? And then roti is also a dish. For example, if I'm searching for Jack's Alu Tiki Burger, so then Jack's is the restaurant, Alu Tiki Burger is a dish, right? This is sequence tagging. This is named entity recognition. So the keywords for you to explore in case you are, you'd want to rebuild this is word to vec, uh, byte pair encoding, bidirectional LSTM and CRF. Right. CRF, it's okay to not dive deep into a bit of math, but in most cases, if you're using, if you're familiar with Python, you'll find a bunch of examples where all of these things are put together and you just have to copy paste and run and train it on your data set. Uh, Kegel has a bunch of data set on this thing. You can feel free to train on that and experiment. It's a very fascinating thing. Right. So now assume that out of all of this, what you got is you got a way to tag a way to identify sequence of words as entities. For example, mix with sabji is a dish, roti is a dish, jacks is a restaurant, alu tiki burger is a dish. Right? Now this is what would help us fire better queries on our search engine, which is what we were discussing at the first. Now, the overall architecture looks something like this of their search. So user is interacting with the search service. Now search service, so user passes what? A search query to the search service. Now search service earlier used to simply fire a search query on Elasticsearch to get the response and send it back. But we saw the problem. The problem was the query was the query contained multiple intent. You had to identify what each entity means in the query so that you can retune your query. For example, if I'm looking for Domino's pizza, what I would do if I identify that Domino's is the name of the restaurant, I would search Domino's in the restaurant collection and pizza in the food menu, right? So that I get better search results. Similarly, if I'm searching for, let's say Jack's Alu Tiki Burger, I know I want restaurant having name Jack and then Alu Tiki Burger is the name of a dish. I can refine my search query so that Elasticsearch does not spit out stupid answers, right? Because it's not its fault, but because we just cannot fire the query as is to the search engine and expect the best result out of it. So here we just take a small detour and instead of search directly firing the query to the search engine, what search does, it search fires a query through this model and identifies the intent. So what we do is we train the model on restaurant, food menu and location. 
This model is trained, hosted on a gateway. You may use EC2 instance Flask server to host it. Name is gateway. I'm just using a generic name over here. So search service first fires an API which talks to the model given the search query tells you the named entities out of it. It uses that and creates as very specialized queries depending on what it got out of this as an uh, from this model as an output and fires a very relevant elastic search query looking for those corresponding things in those corresponding indexes and this way without changing much over here leveraging nlp over here you are trying to find or you are improving the relevance of the system this way now if you type jack's alu tiki burger in Zomato, you see Jack's restaurant at top with Alu Tiki Burger highlighted because it identified it really well, right? And otherwise, it would have given some random answer. Like any restaurant having name Jack's might be on top, and so it would be very hard to identify because query contained a lot of terms. A uh, uh, query contained a lot of entities that it was looking for, right? And this is how Zomato improves their experience like they make their search experience better by identifying query and almost all companies operating at scale have this have this intent identification something trained on their own data set they have this intent identification service and some of the other way built in very similar way right and yeah that is it this is how zomato improves the search query right and all of this all of this is taken from zomato's engineering blog which i've linked in the description down below highly recommend you to check that out so yeah, that is it. That is it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.